July 2010, Pyeongchang, North Korea. 400 people are gathered in an auditorium in the Working People's Culture Palace after taking the North Korean national football team to the World Cup. Following a 44-year-long hiatus, Kim Jong-un would have wanted this to be a gathering to celebrate their success. Instead, the 54-year-old manager knows that he's about to live one of the worst moments of his entire life. Summoned by none other than the supreme leader of North Korea, Kim Jong-il, the manager and his entire squad, except two players, are to be excoriated in this public meeting. The meeting is oddly named the Grand Debate, but in essence, it's all about reprimanding the team in front of athletes, sports students, and the sports minister Park Myung Chul for six hours straight. Moreover, Kim Jong-un is being publicly accused of betraying Kim Jong-un, the supreme leader's anointed heir. The 54-year-old manager probably guessed that losing all three games in the group stage wasn't going to look good on his CV. But now, so much more than his managerial career is in danger. What will be his punishment? How will the supreme leader deal with this abysmal World Cup campaign? Why will the North Korean public never get to know what really happened? Who were the two players that got off the hook and why? And how in the world Sven Guren Eriksson and a Portuguese flight attendant got involved in all of that? Welcome back to Football Files. Today, we're taking a look at the last time North Korea appeared on the biggest stage of international football and how it all led to a series of unbelievably absurd stories and half-truths. July 2014, serious media outlets from all around the world like CBC News, Metro, and Bleacher Report are on to something, or so they want to believe. Like many others, these platforms now feature a particularly interesting World Cup story, a story which goes into fine details of the lies spread by the North Korean state and how it managed to deceive North Koreans into thinking that they have absolutely dominated their group in the World Cup, beating Japan, the United States, and China by 7, 0, 4, 0, and 2, 0, respectively, setting themselves up for a playoff match against Portugal. The source behind Behind the hard-to-believe news was a small-sized YouTube channel called Korea News Backup, which was obviously a backup channel for the North Korean state news, showing images of Kim Jong-un superimposed on the big screens at Rio World Cup Fan Fest. The video spread all over the world like wildfire. While many people in the Western world who were exposed to the news via respected media outlets were giggling or shaking their heads in disbelief, thinking how could they pull off such a thing when North Korea wasn't even qualified for the World Cup. A user on Reddit was busy trying to explain what the heck was going on. The video was from a parody account. The North Korean dialect heard in the video was not even laughable. Albeit with delays that could mount up to 36 hours, World Cup matches were broadcast by the state television, and North Koreans, who are deeply passionate about football, already knew that their team was not qualified for the tournament. The whole thing was the result of an unexpectedly successful spoof. But there was a reason why the people behind the video thought that the rest of the world would believe it. At the end of the day, this wasn't going to be the first time North Korea would lie about what happened during a World Cup. Act 1. Asking for a Favor the year is 2009. Legendary Swedish manager Sven Göran Eriksson is in Pyeongchang, North Korea. Although he's not 100% sure why, he thinks it has something to do with his new boss Russell King's exclusive deals in the East Asian country. Eriksson is the manager of Notts County, the Nottingham-based English side which was recently bought by Munto Finance, a subsidiary of Codback Investments, leading the purchase and appointing Eriksson immediately after after it was none other than King. But the thing is, King doesn't have any deals in North Korea, and in about a decade, he will be behind bars as a fraudster. But that's worth an episode on its own, so let us move on with Ericsson, thinking that he's accompanying his boss to a meeting where the only topic would be opportunities about mining North Korea's mineral reserves. Ericsson finds himself surrounded by North Korean representatives, who are passionate about his role as a member of the FIFA Football Committee. 
North Koreans were asking Ericsson for help, and the Swede was naive enough to think that they wanted balls or shoes or something like that. He quickly understood that what they asked for was far more complicated. They said, we want to have a simple draw. They wanted to have help with the draw. Of course, I said, do you really mean what I think? I can't do that. Nobody can do that. That's absolutely impossible and it's criminal, even to try. Ericsson, as he tried to explain, will have no influence on the group stage draws. In early December 2009, when groups are determined, North Korea will find itself in Group G, objectively the toughest group in the whole tournament, exactly the opposite of what they were looking for. They will come up against Brazil, Portugal, and Ivory Coast, and it won't be pretty. Act 2. The Public Shaming the group stage of the 2010 World Cup started in the most realistic and dignified way possible for North Korea. As the 105th side in FIFA rankings, they were the lowest ranked team that qualified for the tournament. And right out the gates, they were to face the number one side, Brazil. So a two, one loss against the Sela Sao was nothing short of amazing. Chances are, even that did not please the supreme leader back home but at least they had earned the respect of football fans worldwide. The rest of the group stage, however, didn't go out as classy as the first game. North Korea first got absolutely demolished by Cristiano Ronaldo and friends with a 7-0 loss, and then ended their World Cup campaign with a less humiliating 3-0 loss against the Ivory Coast. The coaching staff and players knew full well that they were not going to be welcomed as heroes back home but they couldn't have imagined what awaited them. Upon their return to home, exactly a week after their loss against the Elephants at the Mbambela Stadium, the North Korean football team was facing accusations of treason. Only two players, Jung Tai Se and An Yong Hak, were spared from the public shaming. As they had taken a flight back to Japan, their country of birth and where they played club football, Coach Kim Jong-hun wasn't that lucky, according to the U.S.-based Radio Free Asia. The coach was expelled from the workers' party and would go on to do forced labor in a mine for up to 14 hours a day all as a punishment for betraying the trust of Kim Jong-il. This was borderline insanity, but it wasn't the end of the story. For that, the world had to wait seven more years and a Portuguese flight attendant to visit Pyeongchang. Act 3. Not all of history is written by victors. Many believe that the horrendous news about coach Kim Jong-un getting severely punished was the last they'll ever hear about North Korea's 2010 World Cup campaign. But then, Alvaro Leda spoke to Sabado magazine in April 2017, working as a flight attendant for TAP Air Portugal. Leda was coming fresh off from the East Asian country, and he was dying to share what he heard from the English-speaking North Korean tour guide he got to meet in Pyeongchang. According to Leita, the history of the 2010 World Cup was rather different for North Koreans. Allegedly, the state had cut off the broadcast before Portugal put past three more against North Korea in their match at the group stage. So for the North Korean fans, that game had ended 4-0, but that wasn't it. To make matters worse, or better, at least for the North Koreans, the Supreme Leader had decided to alter the history just a little bit more. According to Leda's guide, the North Koreans' admiration for Cristiano Ronaldo was incredibly high, and that made the next part of the story all the more believable. In that version of the 2010 World Cup, North Korea was beaten by the eventual world champions. Portugal was so strong that they had not only come out victorious against the North Koreans, but also against every single team at the tournament. Needless to say, what the North Koreans managed to do just by rightfully earning their spot to represent their nation at the World Cup was a big achievement. Sad to see that it wasn't enough for the country's not-so-stable leaders. Besides, can you even imagine the incredibly moving story of Andres Iniesta dedicating his World Cup final goal to his late friend Donny Harke does not exist. And there is an alternate reality where Cristiano Ronaldo becomes a world champion 12 years earlier than Leo Messi at that. Talk about a wild story. Can you even imagine what would have happened if North Korean leaders had access to today's technology back then? It could have been easier to become World Cup winners with generative AI, don't you think?